welcome to Belling History with the Good Time Girls, a hyper-local podcast about the quirky history of Bellingham, Washington, and the fourth corner of these United States. Even though we like to keep things close to home, these stories are no less entertaining to the masses and those who find themselves, unfortunately, outside of the PNW. We are your hosts, I'm Ren. And I'm Colby, and we are co-owners of Belling History Tours, also known as the Good Time Girls. If you want to know more about our tour business, visit our website at bellinghistory.com. Today we have another re-release episode from Bad Town, Season 2 of the City of Subdued podcast, hosted by Annika Fleming and Maria Della Gasparina, and co-hosted by us, as well as our founder of the Good Time Girls, Marissa McGrath. Again, we recorded these back in 2020, so it's been a few years. You know the drill. If you've heard them before, feel free to re-listen or skip. Yeah, see you, see you in the <laughs> springtime. We, we'll be back with new stuff. And we've been having a ton of fun making this podcast. It's a lot of work and it's time consuming. So we would love to hear your feedback. If you like this podcast, want us to make more, let us know. Or if you'd like to advertise your local business, please reach out. We are kind of excited about doing the little little, little business plugs for Bellingham. So please reach out to us and you can find us again, bellinghistory.com. Okay, today's episode is called Bad Arson Town. And this is another one featuring Colby and our beloved mother, Marissa McGrath. Bad Arson Town is the story of Frank Spider-Biles, who was captured in 1892 as the recently deposed assistant fire chief, setting intentional fires to buildings throughout Fairhaven. But Spider's story doesn't end there. Yes, this is another story which is cryptically mentioned on one of Fairhaven's historical markers. (laughs) We're very fond of them. (laughs) And yeah, we're going to tell you the story. Let's jump into it and we will see you after. Hello, it's Maria, and welcome to Bad Town, where we discuss the darkest and baddest parts of Bellingham and Whatcom County history. We are joined today by Marissa Hi. and Colby Howdy do. from the Good Time Girls, and they are going to be telling us a really fascinating story today. Do you guys mind briefly giving us a teaser of what the story is going to be about? Sure, I can do that if that's okay. So um, Spider Biles, um, some people might have might hear that name if they live in Bellingham and it sounds vaguely familiar. He was a character from the 1890s in Fairhaven, back when Fairhaven was having kind of its rough and tumble days. And he was accused of a crime of an arson that took place in Fairhaven. And we're going to kind of tell you the, the twists and turns of his story as the Good Time Girls have been talking about him on the Fairhaven Gore and Laura tour for a long time. So we're going to give you the scoop on that. A lot of the research on the story was inspired because there's actually a marker in Fairhaven uh, that were placed all around Fairhaven. So you might see those when you're out walking around along Harris Avenue and um, various other locations in Fairhaven with weird little historic tidbits on them. And one of them says, Spider Biles nabbed here October 1891. So... We use the story on our tour often to tell this really fun story about spider biles at that spot, which is in the cobblestone alleyway uh, between uh, Skylarks and Creativity on 11th Street. So what you're telling me is that there is evidence, material evidence of a historic moment with a Bellingham criminal mastermind? (laughs) Yes. Right. There's there's lots of evidence of that. And so... (laughs) But this one in particular is extra fun. And then you look at the name, a name like Spider Biles, you have to, if you're a history dork like us, and you have the powers to do the research, um, you're like, let's find out more about this guy. And so we've been researching Spider Biles for, I don't know, what would it be like almost eight years now? Definitely since about 2012. Yeah. And Colby has 
has some really great stuff. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the sort of national context that affects his life a little bit more. So yeah, let's get going. Let's get going. Okay. So let's set the stage a little bit. Bring me back to, did you say 1890s, Bellingham, Fairhaven? What's going on around that time? I can tell you that. (laughs) So like Marissa said, the 1890s in Fairhaven, it was pretty Wild West time. The town site of Fairhaven was really the land of Dirty Dan. That's a whole nother story we could get into someday. But he had sold the town for a bunch of money and died in California by this time. And some boosters were really trying to make Fairhaven this fancy town to rival Seattle and Tacoma. Um, And in trying to attract uh, a railroad, um, basically the Great Northern, J.J. Hill's Great Northern Railroad, to create a terminus there. So the buildings were flying up like crazy. It was like a boomtown time. And for instance, J.J. Donovan talked about it. He said, I have seen the slums and brothels in tough frontier towns, but in no place I have been has protected vice been flaunted so shamelessly and flagrantly as it is here. <laughs> yeah, it, it was considered pretty um, wide open is what they used to call it back in the day. So like there were basically like two class of people. There were the, the, the newcomers who had money, a lot of them um, like Larrabee, Charles Larrabee, who has a bust in Fairhaven. And then J.J. Donovan, he's one of the he's one of the dudes on the park benches that you can find. Um, he's on the corner in front of um, where Acme Ice Cream was. And so you, there's this class of people, these like newcomers with money who who came out here. Um, this has happened multiple times in our history as a community. There's like the rich people who show up and because they like the scenery and they think that there's opportunities here. And then there's the other people who are have been here for a while who like that it's got a little it's a little bit crusty and who don't really want it to change. And so there's like that clash comes up again and again. And this is definitely happening in the 1890s. There's um, these guys called the Knights of Pythias at, at around this time who uh, are teetotaling dudes who build a big building, which is now where the Paper Dreams part of Village Books is, um, right kind of capping off the sort of skid row section of uh, downtown Fairhaven. And the Knights of Pythias are making a real statement with their building because they are these guys who have to pledge that they will you know, never be Catholic and never drink. <laughs> and and it's a really strange um, a time period because there's this real clash between these kind of goody two shoes newcomers and the people who came out to this part of the country, specifically the dust bunnies, the ones who collected in the corners because they were trying to get away from, you know, old society. And they really thought, maybe I'll go out to this place where there aren't as many rules and I can make my own rules. So that's Fairhaven at this time. How sad they would be to see Fairhaven today. <laughs> no Seattle, but <laughs> certainly uh, certainly not rough and tumble country. Yeah. There's a story of Dirty Dan looking up and shaking his fist to see this peopled Fairhaven boom that happened after he died, implying that he was, I don't know, maybe in hell looking up, <laughs> shaking his fist. <laughs> yeah, totally. And now, like we said before, Fairhaven is for ants. And yes. um, it's definitely where you go when you when you want to like saunter around and maybe like buy a piece of jewelry and some fudge. I feel like you have to be able to buy fudge somewhere. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. At Paper Dreams, you can buy fudge. You bring your in-laws yeah. there for dinner and stuff like that. Exactly. But it's specifically this rough time that is the reason that that is how Fairhaven has – it got kind of locked in time because um, we, there was this boom around this time. and But then it kind of got associated with bad behavior and – The reason we have all those old buildings is nobody built anything for a really long time. Those buildings weren't prized and honored and loved until much more more recently in that town's history. So, yeah. In historic preservation, they survived out of neglect. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So who is Spider Biles and what is his deal? Yeah. Colby. I want you. All righty. Yeah. So Frank Biles shows up in Fairhaven circa 1889 with his twin brother, Fred Biles and their father, George Biles, and their dad's a carpenter. They're all old Olympia pioneer family. So they're basically participating in that boom era, helping build buildings, etc. Frank actually had a job as a draftsman for Longstaff and Black Architects in Fairhaven. And he also volunteered as a firefighter for Wardner's Hose Company Number 2. So that was all voluntary in those days. It was just basically whatever guys wanted to volunteer and help put out fires when someone pulled the little alarm bell and they would rush there with whatever equipment they could cobble together. So he's doing a good job as a firefighter. 
and earns the title of assistant fire chief in 1891. But the next year, in 1892, after a close election, he lost that position to a rival firefighter. That's the summer when things really started heating up in Fairhaven, as I like to say. (laughs) That summer, the town starts being swept by a series of fires and the papers reporting that they are believed to be incendiary or caused by arson. Yeah, I was going to say... Isn't, aren't all fires incendiary? Like, no. But that just specifically means they were caused by arson. Got it. Cool. So on June 17th, 1892, for instance, a headline read, Firebug Abroad Again. So by saying firebug, they mean somebody's out there who has a bug to set fires. They, they're they into doing this, and this is an ongoing problem. <laughs> I've always found that such to be a strange term of like a bug being someone who, like they're itching to yeah. do Right. I know. It is interesting. (laughs) So this is going on in July. There's another suspicious fire. And at the same time, the paper is reporting on this fire and saying, you know, it's arson again. They also credit Frank Biles as having done some of the very best work in aiding the fire department in fighting this fire. So this is ongoing into the fall. More fires shrouded in the usual mystery. And Frank Biles continues to be the first one to arrive on the scene and does such an impressive job putting out the fires. So on October 2nd, 1892, buildings on 10th Street were on fire just behind the Morgan Block, which is where Good Earth Pottery is on Harris Avenue. And there was another building just adjacent to Good Earth Pottery that's not there anymore that's known as the Blondin Block or Blondin Building. You'll see it in old pictures. It had a big onion dome on the corner where the double-decker bus is now that sells fish and chips. Um, And it stretched down that whole block and met with the Morgan Block. And a guy who had a shoe store in there, Simon Kraft, proprietor of the famous shoe house, he had heard the fire alarm and he was out in the back. There's like a courtyard behind his shop. So he's going to run into the building and warn his staff like something's on fire. And he looks down and sees underneath the Tontine Saloon, which is facing 11th Street roughly near where Skylarks is. And under the foundation, there's boards missing, so you can kind of see under the building. And he sees a guy crawling along in his shirt sleeves, and he yells, and they flush him out. And out crawls Frank Biles. (laughs) And he's in his shirt sleeves, and he's covered in cobwebs because he's just been crawling around underneath the buildings because he was lighting them on fire. So they nicknamed him Spider Biles the Firebug due to him being covered in cobwebs. That's so great. That nickname really works with the whole bug concept as well. So I always imagine this and to make it to make it perfectly clear, he was setting these fires. Was it just because he was trying to get there first and like be seen as the best the best fire volunteer and get the assistant fire chief position back again? Or was there was there other stuff going on? Like, didn't he owe somebody money? Well, that came up in the trial. So there's a lot of questions. The whole string of arsons is kind of actually unusual in his crime history, which turns out to be extensive. (laughs) Oh, so what you're saying is there's more. (laughs) Yes, indeed. So the trial kind of took an interesting twist. Um, You know, it became clear that, you know, he'd been suspected actually for a while, um, arriving first on the scene and putting out these fires. They're kind of like, hmm, this is weird. But one of the building owners was a guy named Joe Alsop, who was a butcher, and he just owned a bunch of property in Fairhaven. And he claimed during the trial that Biles had threatened him after they had some trouble over a bad check. So um, in his defense, Frank Bile said, uh, that actually wasn't me. That was my twin brother, Fred. And so um, his lawyer moved to strike the testimony based on that. But the judge overruled and Biles was actually found guilty and sentenced to 18 months hard labor at Walla Walla for arson. We have a lovely mugshot of him. But this was not the first or the last time that the Biles brothers' identical <laughs> twin status Um, caused confusion during legal scrapes that they had in court because this was before the widespread adoption of fingerprinting. Basically, the system that was used was called the Bertillon or Bertillon, depending on if you're French. So um, that was just basically combining things like measurement and detailed descriptions of people's bodies and like their scars 
Alphonse invented the mug shot. So as soon as photography was a thing, they started doing the profile, the picture, everything like that. Which was a lot easier than being like, they have a brown mole under their right armpit. They did both. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they did both. But yeah, yeah. After they had the mug so, shots. Yeah. Because when you look, when you go to the the state archives, you can see the mug shots, but then there's like a full page of these really kind of detailed description. You're imagining like a naked dude standing there while somebody just scans every single inch of their body. Yeah. There are all these weird things in there about their moles and scars and um, tattoos, which is my favorite part. But so anyway, because of that, like they didn't have a real solid way to tell them apart. Although I don't think they looked super similar, actually. I've seen both of their mug shots, and I, I can tell them apart. But apparently it was hard in a court of law to um, prove which brother had done what. So because both Fred and Frank had a long history of misdemeanor crimes, and they both assumed each other's identities, as far as I can tell, and also used um, you know other aliases. So it was this whole bizarre tangled web, if you will, <laughs> of spider biles criminal history, trying to figure it all out. And they were also both opium users, right? Yeah. So that comes out. I have this whole like timeline of all their trials and crimes and whatnot. And they were basically in and out of prison all throughout the 1890s and early 1900s. So this was in 1915, and it was his brother, Fred Biles, who was charged with forgery. Most of the crimes they were both convicted of or accused of involved forgery or other petty, you know, passing bad checks um, or pickpocketing or things like that. And Fred was charged with forgery in Olympia, and they would um, use each other's identity to dispute their habitual criminal status because they could say, no, I didn't do the time for those crimes. That was my brother and vice versa. I'm just I keep hearing this shaggy song in my head over and over again, just like it wasn't me. (laughs) (laughs) Wasn't me. Right. (laughs) But so supposedly, like, it's hard to say who was who, because I don't know who was doing what at this point. There's so much confusion around it. But it's Fred in the description who was in the pen, and he apparently got his sentence lightened even more by ratting out an opium ring. So he is described in an article as being an opium user, and he tells in detail about this whole trafficking ring, how the drugs brought from Canada in a fishing boat. He says sometimes they conceal it in fake gas tanks, and sometimes they wrap it in foil in the mouths of fish. (laughs) God. Uh, the stuff people will consume after it's been through processes like that. I mean, you don't always know, obviously, but man, I'm like, that is, I do not want to eat something that's been concealed in the mouth of a fish or like even smoke it and certainly not inject it. But yeah. Right. And to me, that that whole opium element in the story was kind of the most interesting thing. And I thought provided motive for their consistent trouble with the law, especially with things like petty forgery. And it, it just kind of brought the question, that, like, what the hell was up with the arson? Like, <laughs> that was just a weird sort of like side crime spree Frank Biles went on. The firefighters were all volunteered to the assistant fire chief or the fire chief. Did they get paid? Was he trying to get a paid No, gig? I don't think so. I think it was just a status thing. Interesting. It's also weird that he was working like his father was a carpenter and built buildings and he was a draftsman helping design buildings, but he really liked to burn them down and then put them out. I mean, just sounds they just both sound troubled, just like capital T troubled. <laughs> Did he burn the buildings that he built or did he build buildings on spaces after they were burned? That's a really good question. Hmm, that adds a whole nother layer. That could be like a, a real estate uh high up the real estate motive. Yeah, maybe he was paid to burn the buildings down and then I put mean, them out. That could happen. I think if you're in t- if you if you're getting paid to do what you love and you already love <laughs> arson. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, he was was he working as a draftsman in in Fairhaven? He's listed in a city directory as a draftsman for Longstaff and Black. Yeah, maybe he was trying to get more work that way. Like maybe he's like, well, I can. Yeah, sorry about your building burning down to the ground. Do you want me to build you another? One? Right. I mean, because we're talking about a time when like fires were extremely common. People were still um, heating their homes with with fire chimneys, and so fires were really common. And we're also talking about a time where like building and money was um, was prevalent. So it would have been really easy work, you know, to, w- easy to get somebody to pay him to build another building if a building burnt down. Um, yeah, I mean, like that's boom a, time. 
That's an interesting theory. I mean, a lot of people sort of thought he was just trying to like, he was mad because he didn't get assistant fire chief and he was trying to like, you know, prove himself as a fireman by lighting fires and then putting them out really well. But I I, I don't know, like, really? (laughs) Yeah. Is that something people would do? I don't know. It's really hard. These are those moments where you're like, um, you just have to go with what the records say and kind of extrapolate out a little bit. And sometimes it's like when people are like, if you'd like to go back in time, what would you like to do? And it's like, I would like to just have a conversation with some of the people who seems to have done really stupid things in the past and ask them why. Well, so so can can we talk a little bit about opium use in Fairhaven while we're at it? So. Right. So that was going to be one of my one of my next questions. We know that uh, Spider Biles was an opium user, and uh, it could have had something to do with him burning buildings. Maybe, maybe not, but had things to do with his other crimes. Was opium use pretty rampant in Whatcom County back in the old days? I'd say yes. It was a huge product that was smuggled in, especially from Canada, um, alongside with actual Chinese people, um, came opium, which was part of their sort of cultural thing. But both of the Chinese laborers and the opium were super profitable things to smuggle. And in Fairhaven in particular, there was a opium den that was associated with the Pacific American Fisheries building. So the Pacific American Fisheries was the largest salmon canning company in the world at some point. And at some point later on, right, there was a there was a bunkhouse that was specifically for Chinese workers. And there was an opium den at that point. And, and that would have been what year are we talking about with that, Colby? It's just early 1900s. Um, that was Sam. His name was Sam Lowe. Uh, he ran a supposedly a noodle noodle house, uh, but it was busted as an opium den. And he was also busted other times in the red light district in Whatcom for uh, running an opium den out of Myrtle Baker's Melville Cottage brothel. So he got around. And Sam Lowe, there was, I've also heard stories about, um, and I've come across examples of their talk about, there was talk about how there were opium dens that were for Chinese. So the opium dens were segregated, basically. So there were opium dens that were for Chinese people in, in, what is now Bellingham. And then there were opium dens that were run by Chinese people that were for white patrons. So when we're talking about um, people like Fred and Frank Biles, um, they ha- would have been able to go to a an opium den that was specific to white clientele, but also not all opium, like people who were very addicted often had their ho- ho- own layout is what it was called. So had all of the, um, had the pipe and the special lantern and all the um, tools that you needed to smoke opium at, at, in your own home as well. People who were really addicted tended to not be able to afford to pay the higher price to go to and actually like consume in the dens. And um, yeah, so that's sort of how I imagine the brothers, they're sort of like maybe scoring opium from the dens, but then kind of taking it back to their places and laying around on mats. There's some great pictures from the Victorian era of like dudes just like laying on like Persian rugs and just spacing out and (laughs) with their long opium pipes. And of course, like doing a lot of weird, like cultural appropriation stuff, like dressed a white guy, like dressed like a Chinese man um, and surrounded by like dragon artwork and smoking opium and stuff like that. So it's a, it, it was a really weird kind of cultural appropriation within that as well but i bet they thought they were really cool oh yeah totally it's just like what hookah bars or whatever right this is what i imagine it's like when we had the hookah bar moment all across the country where people were smoking hookah and just thought like they just thought they were the coolest people in the universe a lot of my friends in high school including (laughs) were just like (laughs) go to the place where like you can get a plate of hummus and then like smoke strawberry flavored tobacco and blow smoke rings and be really and act like you think you're really cool and just embarrass yourself. (laughs) I like smoking hookahs. I'm not. Look, I'm look. I'm not. I I did it too. (laughs) Um, I did play the caterpillar from Alice in Wonderland in a play. So I have pretended to smoke a hookah before. The like the one time I ever smoked a hookah, I spent half of the time saying "Who are you?" over and over again. <laughs> smoke coming out of my mouth. People are like, "This is it was not funny the first time." Please stop. <laughs> oh my god. So, do you guys know how Spider Biles met his ultimate demise? What became of him and his brother at the end? Did they like disappear into the sunset, or 
eventually did their crimes catch up with them in sort of a bad way? Well, um, he he's lived the longest out of everyone in his family. Um, after their parents died, uh, Frank, or Fred didn't live a whole lot longer. He died at age 59 in 1926. Um, and he had been in jail for most of his life. Um, Frank, our spider guy here, he actually, interestingly, got a job at McNeil Island Penitentiary in his later years for a while. Um, so it seemed like he felt pretty at home there. He'd done a couple of, of uh, sentences in that penitentiary and um, ended up getting a job there as like a groundsman where he saw a... Um, epic escape of a prisoner, a train robber named Roy Gardner. That was big news in 1921. But um, later in his life, after his brother's death and his parents were dead, and he was alone. He eventually got married in the 1930s and he was living in Seattle. And there's kind of a funny story of him when he was working as a watchman for the Arctic Fur Company in Seattle at age 61. Um, it was kind of a sadly comical situation where apparently he was drunk <laughs> while on the job as a fur watchman. I'm like, who hires this like ex-con guy to, to after their furs? Yeah, be the night watchman at the fur factory. Um, but anyway, he's working there. Like, you know, my and... mental image is him like laying in a pile of pelts and just like Thanks. drinking directly out of a bottle. Pretty much. <laughs> I think that's kind of accurate. Um, so it, the the article says, for some unexplained reason, he had fired three shots down the basement steps. One bullet struck an alarm and set it off. So the police came <laughs> and they said, Biles was in a rather happy mood. They took his gun away to prevent further damage and left. Um, three hours later, the alarm rang again and the police came back and Biles was like, Someone was trying to drag out these two bundles of fur and out of this back door. So the officers took the furs to safe keep them at headquarters and left again. And then another hour goes by and Biles phones the police. And now he's mad that they took his gun. And he's like, hey, bring me back my pistol or I'm going to come down there and get it. And they're like, come on down. And he goes down there. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, you are stinking drunk. And they put him in a nice quiet cell to sleep off his excitement. <laughs> I just, this is the most, what kind of white nonsense was that? Like, <laughs> that was like, this is the most like, can you imagine something like that happening now? I just, it's like they show up, he's just like randomly shooting. They just take his gun and they just leave him at his job wasted and then they come back a second time and he's like people who try to steal fur guys this, guys guys sh come here come here i gotta tell you something i'm trying to steal it first and so then <laughs> and then then they take the first but they just continue to like leave this guy in this warehouse like it's just like it's just funny it's to weird. me that they didn't initially just go okay also we're just gonna give you a ride home they're like well obviously he can continue to do his job here we'll just leave him here to continue to do this I just, oh my god. Well, if they already had the furs, why did he need to stay and watch? It's a mystery. Oh, well. Oh, oh, spider. So how did he die? This is, yeah, so that's basically nearing the end of his life. He died at age 66 in 1935. Um, just of natural causes. They, I mean, probably a lot of liver damage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, there was no need for an inquest. It wasn't like, you know, anything... He didn't accidentally shoot himself while sitting on a pile of furs or accidentally light himself on fire or. <laughs> no old enemies came to get their last revenge or anything like that. No, he actually had a pretty chill yeah, end of his life. But did he have any children? No, but his wife, who was a former school teacher, she lived into like her 90s. She survived, outlived him by like 30 more years. Never remarried. Well, when you get a man like that, how could you ever replace him? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's so interesting that he um, – it's I've known – I knew his earlier story about the fire and, you know, being – put, you know, having the opium addiction and all that. But I just always assumed he sort of burned out and – um, or died in prison. And it's so interesting because we see this again and again with, like, people from this era. You could, like – 
people basically rehabilitated. They, you know, they would go to prison for a while and then they would like marry a school teacher and settle down after this time period. And like, I just, it seems it's kind of mind blowing to imagine. It sounds like he was probably an alcoholic (laughs) given the fur incident, but you know, maybe he had managed to kick dope and, you know, settle down a little bit moved on, married a school teacher. Thank you guys so much. I had so much fun learning about one of Bellingham's resident bad boys, Spider Biles. And I'm super excited for whatever story you have lined up next. Well, with that, we are going to say good night to the beautiful good time girls. Thank you guys so much for being on the show. Oh my gosh, that story just never gets old. I think, like Marissa said, I think it's so fascinating how many of these characters at the turn of the century who lead these crazy lives of crime or drug addiction, or even as we talk about on some of our tours, spent as a working girl can go on and settle down and lead very quote unquote normal lives. Spider, I don't know if you could call his a normal life, yeah. <laughs> but you know, better than Bad Bud. He was hanging out, yeah. you know. Chilling. Yeah, he, Bad, he better than free Bad man. Buddy. He, he was did. a free man. Yeah. yeah. I, maybe, Colby, you have some input on that, but probably, you know, that is owing to the fact that prison records and mugshots were not widely accessible. Moving to a new town, you could really get a fresh start, unlike these days. Yeah, I think it depends on a lot of things. I think that you'll see both kinds of stories, as I think mm. Bad Bud and yeah. Spider Biles are <laughs> illustrating. Mm-hmm. Um, some probably just involves a little luck and who knows? But um, yeah, it was weirdly, people could get away with things, it seems like, more easily back then mm-hmm. in some ways. Like you, if you had the means and the, the like brains to like move and lay low, <laughs> yeah. you know, you could. <laughs> right. But I don't think everybody has. Not everybody has that. The ability yeah. to do that. It's hard not to like ever contact your loved ones again and things True. like that but or addictions yeah. will get you right back yep. in it yep. yeah yeah like, exactly like but there are spider. weird i mean there's like stories of like serial killers you know where they yeah. just go <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, like our friend romandorf just assuming mm-hmm. different identities just a new identity everywhere he goes yeah. nobody had id yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's. I'm like, how did police do anything? I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, how detectives really work. No point. I know you had to be really cool. <laughs> detectives were the work. Pinkertons. Yeah. <laughs> mm, next season, find some detective Bellingham stories. Yeah. yeah. So that's really all I have to add on yeah. that. But all right, I love our spider bile story. He's a I, good one. I do love that one. It's it's been an oldie but a goodie as yes. well, and I love the research that that went into that. It's, yeah. it's pretty impressive. I like it a lot. So this will be coming out near the end of November, so we're going to add in a little announcement to save the date. If you are around in Bellingham Friday, December 22, we invite you cordially to join us at the Crystal Ballroom in the Hotel Leo for a holiday party. Yes, yes. Yeah, we are going to try something a little different this year. Ren, we started out doing those <laughs> sil- not so silent night pub crawls. Yeah, so long ago, very long time ago, with Marissa and Sarah in yeah. the early days. We have some very loyal patrons of those tours, yes. and so we're gonna shake up and we're gonna be inside all night. It's gonna be really exciting. Yes, you don't have to walk around in the sleet and the snow it and is. the cold. It has gotten yes, this last couple of years we've gotten really <laughs> belted. It's yeah. been some real cold yeah. weather walking around. So And it was really lovely of the Leo they to in, be interested in having us in their beautiful ballroom. So we're like, yes. let's have a party. Yes. So we'll have a holiday themed spelling history party with caroling and trivia and all the usual good stuff that we do. Mm-hmm. You just won't have to be outside. And yeah, and there'll be food and booze at the ready. <laughs> and so um, we know all that. We don't have any other details nailed down yet. Yes. So see Just our save website. the date. Save the date. December 22nd, Mark. 2023. Mark your calendars. All right, that wraps up the episode. Well, hey there, mama. Where'd you go? You gotta be just what you saw. That's too bad. Too bad. We 
we'd like to thank you all for listening to Belling History with the Good Time Girls. Do subscribe, review our podcast on your favorite podcast platforms, like us on all the social medias, and check out our tours and events. Read our show notes and blog, all of that at bellinghistory.com. always we'd like to thank Devin Champlin and the late great Lucas Hicks for the use of the Gallus Brothers song Too Bad West Coast Blues. You can find the Gallus Brothers tunes and Devin Champlin's tunes on Bandcamp and you can find Devin at Champlin Guitars in Bellingham. I lost my hat, lost my brim, looking like a crow's nest, swinging from a limb, that's too bad, too bad. Well I got no bugging, I got no smokes, I look like Grandpa and all of his folks, that's too bad. Tune in next time for more Belling History and Bad Town. Thank you. Thanks.